So there's really something profound about priority and miracle, priority and what you see as an ROI, as a return on your investment, and the deeds that you put forth with absolutely no expectation mm -hmm. of a dunyawi return, of a worldly return. Like you're just glad that Allah allowed you to perform the deed. The one that is indulging upon their wealth to a degree that it causes them to forget about Allah, or they're using it in a way that they're just fulfilling their desires. And it could lead to even hedonism to where you just fulfill your desires because that can ultimately and ultimately become your Lord. Think of good deeds as the best investment. And I'll give you an example. I'm gonna show you this right here. This is not uh, lipstick, by the way. It looks like it, but it's not. It's perfume. Is right? that mace? Is you got pepper spray me on the no, on no. set, man? It's a, it's a perfume. Watch out, Sheikh. Sheikh. Check this out. The Prophet he said, Ali al Aliya, Khairum min al sufla. Mm. The upper hand is better than the lower hand. And the upper hand is metaphorically said for the giving hand, and the lower hand is the receiving hand. But when the Prophet so would awesome. give hadiyah to somebody, how would he give it? He would give with his lower, lower hand. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. The question from yesterday's juz, which Prophet was sent to the people of Al Hijr? So please go ahead and answer below, bidnillahi ta'ala. And inshallah ta'ala, with that, you want to welcome, of course, Sheikh Abdullah Duru and this guy, Mufti Abdurrahman, <laughs> Wahid, mashallah. The one and only. The one and only. And just came from the goat of UFC to the goat of Da'wah, mashallah. Oh, oh. man. Sheikh Abdullah or me? I, I didn't, none of you. Oh, okay. Someone else in the room. <laughs> Someone Why else you guys think I'm talking about you guys? Mashallah, <laughs> mashallah. And um, the vest is nice, man. Jazakallah khair. Oh, yeah, it's nice. You want it? I'll give it to you right now. Always trying to, wow. always up in the game, man, mashallah. Did exactly. you just come from a wedding? Did you fly in that? I, I flew in this, yes. You flew wearing yes. this? Yes. What are you doing? Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> That's your da'wah? That's my da'wah. The turban was enough, Sheikh. Well, um, who said I was wearing a turban? I was wearing a baseball cap. <laughs> a baseball cap with that? <laughs> He's just judging me, man. Musliba. Musliba. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you. <laughs> but, alhamdulillah, man. We're happy to have you as Jazak always. Thank Jazak you so much, Habibi. Of course, I don't know, do, do you associate with Miftah? Uh, I think, isn't Miftah like owned by Yaqeen? No, it's not owned by Yaqeen. <laughs> It's a subsidiary, but yeah, it's a, it's yeah, a, it's so a, so. It's a Michigan I guess branch so. of Yaqeen. I guess so. I guess so. That's a DBA. <laughs> Keep an arm's length just for liability purposes. <laughs> you know. just, 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 just enough, you know, just enough. You know. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you for inviting us here and doing it live. You know, of course, we used to do it on screen before and it's, there's a good vibe to it, but sitting with both of you, it's, no, it's, it's I appreciate it so much. May Allah bless you. And institutional unity, Alhamdulillah. So Allah. We're, we're doing Qalam, IOK, Miftah. Uh, so alhamdulillah, we're, we're, we're trying to have as much of that as possible. May Allah bless you, Sheikh Omar. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah khair. Happy to have you. And inshallah ta'ala, with that, we'll get started. SubhanAllah, what a powerful juz. Juz 15. And this is the only juz that I'm going to be doing in Quran 30 for 30, where I honestly do not want to talk about one ayah or a couple of ayat, but I do actually want to talk about something in the juz that pertains to Qadr. If there is any juz to study to understand the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the juz to study the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how it manifests itself in various people's lives. For one, uh, Surah Al-Isra talks about the miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Surah Al-Kahf talks about the miracle of the awliya, ordinary people, pious people. Surah Maryam, the miracles of the prophets that came before. But subhanAllah, there are many things to talk about when it comes to these miracles that have shown up in the lives of these people. For one, what was a miracle for one group of people is almost always a punishment for another group of people in the, in the situation of these. And there, there are a few people um, that this is not uh, applicable to. So with the miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came the punishment of Mecca. With the miracles of the people of Al-Kahf, there are punishments to others. In Maryam alayhi salam, there's a proof against her people and their coming uh, punishment as well when they uh, accuse Maryam alayhi salam and uh, they obviously carry out their plot against Isa alayhi salam. And the point of that from a Qadr perspective is that in the same decree, multiple parties are affected in different ways. And of course, in the process have their Qadr altered, their divine decree affected and altered. Now, the ultimate story of Qadr, obviously, is uh, the story of Musa and Al-Khadr. The story of Musa, Isa, and Al-Khadr. And you have to know that when you are reading the Qur'an, 
you are Musa in your own story and you are wondering about the Qadr of Allah while Allah is the one who's teaching you. You're the Musa of your story and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your teacher when it comes to Al-Qadr. In the case of Musa alayhi salam and Al-Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching Musa alayhi salam through Al-Qadr. In your case, in our case, Allah azza wa jal is teaching us through Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us through the various twists and turns that take place. There's only one real reflection, subhanAllah, I want to share with you um, from the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards to the people that are mentioned in the story of Musa Islam and Al-Khadr. And it's something that I noticed for the very first time, honestly speaking, and that's the beauty of the Quran is that every time you read, you always find something, subhanAllah, new. But I want you to pay attention to how the Qadr of Allah takes into consideration past, present, and future, and how that is the case for every single group of people affected in the story of Musa Islam and Al-Khadr, who he's being exposed to. Now realize Musa Islam is watching ordinary people go through certain tribulations or have certain things happen to them. And he's getting the divine explanation. Most of the time, we don't get the divine explanation. The Prophet Sallallahu said, of course, I wish that Musa Islam, or if only Musa Islam would have been more patient, we would have gotten even more, right? In terms of the divine explanation for some of these incidents. But look at how past, present, and future are taken into consideration. In the case of the people of the ship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused something to happen in the present to ward off a present danger. Of course, there were people that were behind them that would have taken that ship. And so the destruction of that ship was to ward off a present danger. In the case of the boy that was killed, it was because of a future threat, what that boy would have grown up to become, something that we also can't see. So sometimes we can't see the present danger. We also can't see the future threat. And in the case of the people for whom Musa Islam and Khadr built the wall, it was due to a past good deed, right? The, the father that came before that was a righteous father. And that shows you, subhanAllah, that when Allah Azza wa Jal is in control of every single situation, it's not just taking into consideration the present and what you can't see of the present. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what has been and what will become and what would become. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees perfectly with all of that taken into consideration. And that's part of how we come to terms with the beauty of the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, obviously, all of us can find ourselves in a situation where there is a present danger that we don't know about or a future threat that we're unaware of, or perhaps we're benefiting from a past good deed. But at the end of the day, none of us will have the divine explanation given to us here. It will all be on the day of judgment. And that's why the only way a person comes to terms with the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by their comfort in knowing that Allah Azza wa Jalla is the one who's planning and that everything will make sense and everything will be rewarded on the day of judgment should we respond with tawakkul. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people mm -hmm. of trust, people of tawakkul, people of reliance mm -hmm. upon him, Allahumma ameen. With that, I'll pass it to Shaykh Abdullah. Barakallahu feekum. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la amma ba'd. In regards to trust and tawakkul and particularly in the case of what he was mentioning with Musa and Khadr, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of not knowing and subhanAllah moving forward and having full certainty in his knowledge and his beautiful attributes that he possesses subhanAllah. Also trusting the fact that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you is best for you. And whatever he gives you, we don't use it in a way that is not befitting. We don't use it in a way that only satisfies and fills our nafs, our desires, what we desire. And that desire does not coincide, does not agree with, does not comply with the system that he has given you, the Sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks <clears throat> about this in Juice 15, particularly uh, in chapter of Isra, verse number 26 and verse 27. When he speaks about the concept of tabvir, and tabvir is spending wastefully. Even as some scholars mentioned, even wastefully in that which is mubah, that which is permissible. It's not halal, it's not haram. So for instance, buying clothes, uh, buying things that you may need is that which is considered, could be considered mubah, right? There's even the concept of tabdir in this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here, he says, after Ardu bin Lam Shaitan Rajim, when he talks about the types, the categories of people that one should spend on, he says here after Ardu bin Lam, وَآتِ ذَا قُرْبَ حَقَّهُ وَالْمِسْكِينَ وَبِنِ السَّبِيلِ وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ تَبْذِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, give near, give to the near of kin his due and also to the needy and the wayfarer. Do not squander your wealth wastefully. There's a beautiful story of Umar al-Khattab. 
he saw Jabir radiallahu anhu and Jabir had some lahm with him. And you know, he Jabir had some some meat the day before. So Umar bin Khattab, he asked him, is this, a, what is this? He said, this is lahm. He said, Ama akalta ams? He said, did you not eat this yesterday? He said, yani, ashtahi ya, ya amir mu'mineen. And then he said, Ama kullam ashtahaitu mashtaraitu? He said, is it everything that you desire, you just spend and buy? So this question here is a question that we should always ask ourselves because the whole concept of the dunya is that which is beautiful. Zuyyana lil ladhina kafaru al hayatul dunya. The dunya is there and it's a test and it's an obstacle as some would say. It's a test for you because it's going to see, Allah is going to see how you indulge upon the dunya because what you use there is from the dunya that you need, no doubt about it. And there's from those things that you need that you voluntarily deprive yourself of to a certain time of the year, obligatory deprive yourself from that, such as Ramadan, eating and drinking, depriving yourself for a, spirit, a, a period of time during the day for 30 or 29 days. Here, tabdir is where you spend, even in that which is permissible and mubah, but you spend over too much to where it can cause you and divert you from spending in that which is good, especially if you do not spend in any type of charitable events or charitable causes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when speaking about this, he's telling you to give to these categories, give to the near of kin. So to your relatives that may need something and also to the needy, the needy, the ones that don't have anything, some scholars mentioned that doesn't have that which is suffice for them for the day, to give to them and also to the wayfarer. And the wayfarer is the person that is visiting from another area, you know, another city, another village during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, someone will be traveling with their camel and they may need some sustenance for the day. And it's important and subhanAllah, the wisdom behind that is that that individual may not know anyone in the locality to where he may, it may result in him being a villain because he may not, he may need to get what he needs to get. But if someone takes it upon themselves, وَيُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَ and they are the ones that believe in Allah in the last day as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned from the characteristics that they are righteous, they are good to the neighbor or good to the, the, the guest. So giving to these people, which is suffice as some mentioned for one night and one day to assist them to go upon their journey. But the one that is indulging upon their wealth to a degree that it causes them to forget about Allah or they're using it in a way that they're just fulfilling their desires. And it could lead to even hedonism to where you just fulfill your desires because that can ultimately and ultimately become your Lord. To fulfill just whatever you want to do, Allah has blessed you with money, but you use it in a way that is not befitting and it could be looked at or in reality, hubbad dunya wa karahiyat al maut to where one loves the dunya and they hate death. They despise it. They don't want to hear about it. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when giving these categories that one should spend on, it reminds him of the one who has given it to him and it reminds, being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it reminds him of the categories that he <clears throat> mentioned to be thankful, thankful and giving to them and not wasting the money in that which is not befitting. And I'll just leave with one statement, subhanAllah, that the, many of the scholars mentioned that some will say the one that is, the one that is generous, they say, la sirfa fil khair. And the one that is miserly, the one that spends in, uh, for themselves, for their desires, la khaira fi sirf. Meaning that there is no, when we spend in good, we don't even consider this spending because it's in the good. It's, it's that which is good. We're not losing anything from it. sadaqatun min mal. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, that charity does not decrease wealth. But then those that may be miserly and they have tabdir and they spend in that which is not beneficial or they fulfill their desires when spending, is that they say, la khaira fi sirf. There's no good in, 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 in spending in this fashion. So <clears throat> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those that recognize what we have been given is from Allah and whatever he orders us to do or recommends for us to do to give for his sake, even though at times it may be uncomfortable, it may be something that we may not be used to, but doing it with the right intention is that which can help you and help others. Without a doubt, it is worship. And that is a pleasure with what Allah has placed on this earth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that are pleased, pleased with this qadr, past, present, and inshallah what he has there for us in the future. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Abdullah. May Allah bless you and Shaykh Umar. Mm -hmm. um, you guys gave me five minutes. It takes me 10 minutes to put my imama on, my turban on. So <laughs> you make me speak only for five minutes. But may Allah bless you guys. Amen, amen. As I was sitting here and thinking, uh, there is there are three verses, but they're all connected. Verse number, I'm going to pull Dr. Zakir Naik on you guys. Allah. Verse number seven, uh, verse 15, 
and then verse 46 of the verse fifth. number seven, seven verse 15 verse number seven of isra okay. verse 15 of surah isra and verse 46 of surah kahf all right here it goes this is an interesting thing okay now you know, why, why are you smiling when you talk to me <laughs> i'm oh. ready i'm ready to hear we're it. happy i'm gonna drop it now okay all right, so, go ahead bismillah so first the serious part Life, I believe life is a vicious cycle of someone suffering and then someone benefiting from their suffering. And it's a continuous cycle of that, right? I'll give you an example. My brother, he passed away, rahmatullahi, October 5th in a car accident. Now, at that very moment, the entire family is suffering and in pain. But the tow truck company is benefiting from the car. So from that suffering, the tow truck company is benefiting. The junkyard is benefiting for another car. I haven't looked at a junkyard again the same way in my life because my, my brother's car went to the junkyard. They dismantle it. They get money from every single piece they dismantle. Hmm. My brother, Sheikh Abdullah, he said that Tuesday, October 6th, you know, when you first hear the news, it's very difficult. It's the most difficult thing, hearing the news of pain and suffering. He says more, it's more difficult than hearing the news of my brother passing away was Tuesday when he went to the cemetery and they had to choose a grave site. And he said the lady who was showing us the different grave sites on a, on a piece of paper, you know, drawings, she was showing us p sites for a grave like a person shows a plot for land for sale. You want this one, this is closer to the road, it's going to be $3,000. Yes. You want that one, access to that is closer, it's going to be this much. And he was looking at her... Like, subhanAllah, like, this is how you sell plots for a house, the corner plot. So this, this cemetery is benefiting one more sale mm -hmm. from someone suffering. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, verse number seven, in ahsantum, ahsantum ni'afasikum. You do something good, the first one to benefit from that is yourself. You're not benefiting Allah. When asatum falaha. You do something bad, the first one to suffer from that bad is yourself. So if we look at in the next verse number uh, 415, mm -hmm. You're guided, you do something good, you pray salah, you give sadqah. The first one to benefit from that is yourself. If we start just looking at it from just a materialistic standpoint, which is a horrible thing to do. But look what Allah is telling us. The greatest ROI, return on investment is a good deed. It's the most guaranteed return on investment, is a good deed. Nothing else in this world is a guarantee that you'll get something from it. You do a bachelor's degree, you become a doctor, you become this. There's no guarantee of anything. But a good deed, Allah says, We will never waste someone's good deed. Verse number 46 in Surah Kahf, Allah says, Al-mal wal banoon, zinatul hayat dunya, wal baqiyatul salihatul khayrun inda rabbika thawab, wa khayrun amala. Like mm. the good deeds are the best thing. And in Surah, Surah can, can Maryam, yeah, he said, well, baqiyat, wealth and children are the adornment of this dunya. And well, baqiyat salihat, those deeds that are everlasting, that are remaining, are khayrun inda rabbika thawaban. They are the best in terms of reward and they are the best in terms of hope. Like, you're, like human beings, most, like most people who are, don't, that have, they don't live a life of Islam, they, they are planning for retirement. But Muslims, we plan for the day we die. After that, our real life starts. And when we, when we plan for that, good deeds will benefit us now. It's a return on investment. Because right away when you do a good deed, every good deed you do, the moment you do a good deed, this is, this dude, Allah subhanahu wa puts his, this light on your face. Allah puts his light in your heart. Allah puts expansiveness, puts barakah in your risk. Allah gives you strength to do more good deeds, you know, tawfiq. And he puts love in the hearts of people. This is something prophetic that the Prophet taught us, the Quran teaches us in this surah. Think of good deeds as the best investment. And I'll give you an example. I'm going to show you this right here. This is not uh, lipstick, by the way. It looks like it, but it's not. It's perfume. Is that right. mace? Is you got pepper spray me on the no, no. set now? It's a, it's a perfume. Watch out, Check this out. The Prophet he said, Alidul Aliya, Khairum Min Lady Sufla. The upper hand is better than the lower hand. And the upper hand is metaphorically said for the giving hand. And the lower hand is a receiving hand. But when the Prophet would give hadiyah to somebody, how would he give it? He would give with his 
lower, lower hand. hand. Now show this on the camera. Look, this is Sheikh Umar's beautiful hands. The one who's giving is the lower hand. And the one who, this is your gift. The one who's taking Allah is the Allah upper Allah hand. Allah. Okay, why though, Sheikh? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi through the way he's giving is demonstrating that the one who's taking is better than the one who's giving. Because you gave me an opportunity. Yeah. I'm going to get the reward for it. That's why we fight to pay the bill. Because that's a selfish act as well. Even though it looks like a generous act, you fight to pay the bill because you know that when, if you are able to pay the bill, you're going to get that money in your account. You're going to get the barakah and you want that. So as I was reading this, these verses, this is what, these are the thoughts that came to my mind. Look at good deeds as a guaranteed investment. So now it's better for you, just do it. And any good deed, inshallah, will be a great return on investment in this world and the hereafter. Beautiful insights. Zakhla khair for the perfume. I'll give it back to you. No, it's yours. You can't give it back to me. It's hadi. It's unlike. We can't take it back. <laughs> but it's not. Don't make sure you don't take it on in, in, in public because it might look like lipstick or a vape. Uh, it looks like it looks like it looks like mace. <laughs> Seriously, man. It looks like you know like. No, no, no. That's a travel size too. It's a travel size, you know? a travel size exactly. Mashallah. Zakhla khair. There's something that that I think is important to mention here. Specifically, subhanAllah, when it comes to miracles and when it comes to extravagance and when it comes to ROI and what you're putting forward. This is the chapter in which you see the mention of Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. It can feel weird to be extravagant when there's a genocide in the background. Extravagance is always bad, but when there's a genocide taking place, it feels worse. And perhaps that's a good thing for us to kind of wake up, you know, and like, just as we kind of like talk to our kids and say, look, you're complaining about this. Look at these children in Palestine. Not that there weren't suffering children before, but look, pay attention. This is on our hearts and on our minds right now. That's the first thing I think about with extravagance. And when I think about ROI, and I think about the things we put forward, it can feel like we're doing so much, but we're seeing so little when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. What more can we possibly do? And then I think about the miracles. How many times have people tapped out on Jerusalem? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought it back to the Ayyad Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. It's not the first time in history. So, you know, Nuruddin, Rahimullah, Zangi Rahimullah, of course, famously had the menbar built from Mazd al Aqsa before it was liberated. All right? A lot of people in those places could be thinking about their own throne, could be thinking about, you know, their crown, thinking about the way that they're dressed, thinking about so many of these little things. And despite all of that, and these impossible, seemingly impossible circumstances, he's spending on the menbar of Al-Aqsa before it is liberated, of course, by Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, rahimahullah ta'ala. There's really something profound about priority and miracle priority and what you see as an ROI, as a return on your investment, and the deeds that you put forth with absolutely no expectation mm -hmm. of a dunyawi return, of a worldly return. Like you're just glad that Allah allowed you to perform the deed. Similar, similar to dua, you're just glad Allah let you make the dua. Mm -hmm. Like Umar al-Khattab when he says, you know, I don't concern myself with the answer to my dua, I just concern myself with the ability to make it, because I know that if Allah allowed me to make the dua, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certainly is gonna give me something. Allah, that's so the same thing is true with a good deed. I don't concern myself with whether or not, like I'm not weighing, okay, if I give this much sadaqah, I'll get this much back, if I do this, uh, no. I am merely happy that Allah Azza wa Jal gave me the ability to do the good deed, because Allah would not have let me do the good deed unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give me something good in return. Allah. Only in the akhirah maybe, or in the akhirah and in the dunya. But at the end of the day, whether it's in the hereafter exclusively or both the hereafter and this life, which is certainly the case in many transcendent ways. Alhamdulillah for the ability to do good. Alhamdulillah for the blessing of Islam. Like, Alhamdulillah, you know, for being able to fast. Alhamdulillah for being able to pray tarawih. Alhamdulillah for being able to read the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. What, what more to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for than the ability to do these things? And if it's just the internal peace that Allah gives you that no one can find in a package, no one can find in anything that they're purchasing, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah for that. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. You know, out of the fadl of Allah, it's His grace, it's His mercy that He's allowed you to be in this position. Like Allah has given you tawfiq, what you just said, to fast, to sit down right here, like we're sitting here right now. Allah is saying, be happy, smile. You know, so in khutbah, you know, we should maybe not smile, but otherwise in the masjid, you should be smiling. 
إذا سرت كحسنتك وساءت كسيئتك فأنت mm-hmm. مؤمن That's why I'm always smiling Because uh-huh. Alhamdulillah we're always doing something We're trying to publicly You know we're always doing in a, in a good situation, good setting But Sheikh, Wallahi what you said I believe that Ummah should be making this dua a lot that, that This is, we're sitting at Yaqeen campus A dua the Prophet would so, always so, make at the end so. of a gathering Long dua, the portion, the one portion Allah maqsimna min khashatika ما تحول به وبيننا من نواصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغني بجنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا. Translation like oh Allah give me that fear that will be a portion of that fear that will help me stay away from sins. Give me a portion of that tawfiq that will help me do deeds that will lead me to jannah. And oh Allah give me that conviction that will make it easy for me to go through difficulties in this life. So yes the ROI may not be here right away but if you have conviction you have yaqeen that you're going to get it in jannah. You're going to get it the moment you die. This, the brothers and sisters in Gaza, as they're becoming shaykh, when my father was told that his son passed away, a Palestinian came to my father and said, La adri am nuhannik am nuazik. I'm not sure if mm. I should be congratulating mm. you or I should be giving you condolences. That's yaqeen, man. I'm not sure. I'm in, a mixed, I'm, I'm in a mixed feeling over here. Should I congratulate you that your son is a shaheed or should I give you condolences? So these brothers and sisters who are leaving this world, yes, I mean, we probably don't see it right now, but the moment they leave this world, Allah is asking them, do you want something? You know what they're asking? Oh Allah, send me back so I can become shaheed again. Mm. Let's, let's not be the ones who when we leave this world, Allah, you know, and we are, instead of Allah asking us, we're asking, oh Allah, please send us back. Mm. There's a two different, con- there's a huge difference. Over here, those people leaving this world, they're leaving with that and asking Allah to, to return them to become shaheed. And we, hopefully we're not going to be among those who are asking Allah to send us back so we can do one good deed. So there's always going to be, so may Allah bless you for that, you know, approach Allah towards Allah this discussion. Allah 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 Shaykh, you got any last reflection for us? No, Allah, Allah. Allah, Allah, Allah. Mufti Saab, it's been a few years since your brother passed away, Rahimullah. But you still keep talking about him. Yeah. Someone might say that that's a sign of a lack of patience. Of course, we know that not to be the case because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi still remembered Khadija radiallahu anhu, anha all these years. They remember our loved ones all these years. How can you actually show that grief mm. is in fact tied to gratitude? Honestly, um, I'll, I'll just share like this on this last week on Monday, I went to do ta'ziyah aza for a family in Phoenix who lost their son Talha over the weekend in a car accident. Rahmatullah. And... Uh, he passed beautiful through. family, by the way. Yeah, yeah. beautiful family. And so I went for, uh, Monday morning for their Azhar. And uh, the only son of the family is Sheikh Abdullah. No, they have no other children, just one son. We have five brothers. And we lost one. And when I went to visit them, like the pain and suffering that people are seeing in Gaza has actually made it easier for them to go through the suffering. The same thing with Brother Aftab Diwan here. Mm-hmm. Our guy here, so. when he lost Hadi, Abdul Hadi. They mentioned that him and his wife, sister Hanifa, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them, and they lost their one son, Hadi. Rahimahullah. Uh, he was saying on the way to the graveyard that what's happened in Gaza has given them the ease. Like just a dignified burial exactly. is in and of itself a ni'mah that in, we thank Allah for now. So I, I was thinking like, man, if my brother passed away during this time, it might have been easier for us. You know, like, because we've seen what's going on, you know. But the reality, and I look then I look at Sahaba, like there's, there was probably no home in Medina that didn't have someone who was shaheed in Uhud. Mm-hmm. And so there are people who are grieving, giving condolences to others who are grieving. Mm. And, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had so, the people of, Bad, of Uhud in his heart and his mind always present, always go there and you know, say salam to the people uh, and make dua for them. So I believe there's a lot to be taken from that. So, I mean, when I... I believe my brother is leaving this world. Of course, we, we're grief and law. We're, we're in so much difficulty. I see my mom every day, speak to my father. It's always there. But Alhamdulillah for teaching us so many lessons from his, from his death. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah for the love that Allah has given us after he left this world. Alhamdulillah for the, the tears that we, are allowed, we, we, are, we can shed in dua now. Before it was harder. Like mm-hmm. I, go to, I go to Rawda. I'll be honest with you. I, it was, it was, there was a challenge to cry at whenever I wanted to, even though that's not the objective of dua, but it's, you know, I was I'm in rawda, and now I'm in rawda of the Prophet Sallallahu and I'm making dua in sajda, Allahumma ja'al qabr akhi rawda min riyad al-jannah. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, subhanAllah. Allah make my brother's grave a garden from the garden to While I'm in the garden of jannah in this world. Mm. So Beautiful. yeah, I mean, it's not that I, th- I think about it, it's not that I plan it, but it always helps you. 
So th- there's always some hikmah behind this grief and the destiny of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it just comes out, Shaykh. May Allah have mercy on him. Amin. Amin. Zakallah khair for always being so vulnerable with us, man. Uh, we love you and uh, love having you here. And subhanAllah, I remember when he passed away and obviously we had our webinar in COVID. Mm-hmm. We were talking about how we're dealing with grief. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him and accept him as a shaheed and make it easy for you and your family. Um, we ask all of you, inshallah, to please make du'a, inshallah ta'ala, for him and to make du'a for the family. Barakallahu feekum. We'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.